Well, I hope I can live up to that introduction. Well, wow, thanks, Roger. Um, the computer story is a little different than that. I didn't go to my dad and say, buy me a computer. My dad walked in my office one day, this is 1972, and said, I've got some great news for you. I just bought you a computer. And I'd taken, I literally had two Fortran classes at the University of Utah. That was the full extent of my computer background, which used 80 column punched cards. I said, what kind of computer is it? And he said, it's an IBM System 3. And I said, how much should he cost? And he said, $85,000. <laughs> I said, have you lost your mind? I said, what kind of software did you buy? And he said, what software? <laughs> Literally. So that's how I ended up in the computer business. Uh, the first computer had 8K of memory. <laughs> That'll tell you how long ago that was. So anyway, I am thrilled to be here today. Education has all of a sudden become a huge part of my life. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was recruited, recruited by the United Way to lead an initiative trying to reform eighth grade math in Utah. So I find my, myself in eighth grade math classes, and I have to tell you, our education system is a disaster. 44% of kids in Granite School District in Salt Lake City, which I think is one of the better school districts, 44% of the kids are at grade level in eighth grade math. If you are uh, English as a second language student, it's less than 7%. Your chances of graduating from high school at those numbers is near zero. So. I'm working with Toyota and a company called iReady, and we think we've got some ideas we can help change uh, the way students learn using computers. Who knew, right? And instead of a teacher, I, literally, I walk into a classroom and it's the same, it hasn't changed. It's a teacher in front of a screen trying to teach a lesson with a third of the kids get, a third of the kids have no clue, and a third of the kids are looking out the window. I mean, it's, it's just, it's baffling to me. So. We've had some fun with that. I now have four students that I'm responsible for, and we've got a bunch of super volunteers for our Subaru store. But, so education is really critical, I think. And um, I, the message I, one of the messages I want to share with you is how important being in college is. And I didn't have that opportunity. I, I had a year and a half at the University of Utah. I had to deal with my dad. If I worked full time, he'd pay my tuition. I walked in one day to get my tuition check, and he said, we need to have a talk. Come in tomorrow at 10. Well, you know that's a bad thing when your dad wants to schedule an appointment to talk with you. So I walked in and he said, Howard Moody is leaving. Howard was the number two employee in the company, been with us for, since we opened in 1953. He said, Howard's leaving, I want you to take his job. And I'm tired of doing this, so if you don't want to do it, that's okay. I'm going to sell the store and you can go do whatever you want to do, but I'll give you until tomorrow at noon to decide. I was 20. Wow. So at the time, I was the treasurer of a fraternity at school, which is the worst job in the whole world because nobody pays dues and everybody wants a party every weekend. So I think because of that, more than anything, I said, OK, I'll do it. So my first, my first month, um, General Motors used a four-page financial statement. I didn't know whether you started on the front page or the back page. I mean, it was a total miracle that I got through that. And my mom was pretty adamant that I went to college, so I started going, so I've kind of got that figured out, and it was just before the computer showed up, and so I went back to college, and I started taking some upper division management classes, and I was in a coat and tie, and knew the answers, and aced the midterm, because he was talking about what I did every day. I had 35 employees, and I was learning about how to motivate employees, and all the regulations, and so he called me in his office, and he said, what's your deal? And I told him, and he said, well, why are you here? And I said, because my mom thinks I need to get an education. And he said, you will learn more running that business than we will ever teach you. And luckily, it worked out. But I have three kids. One has a doctorate in, um, in physical therapy. One has a master's degree in business, and the other is like me, had two years of college. And uh, the two younger ones are our boys. One's running our Toyota store, one's running our Subaru stores. And the son that has a master's degree that's running the Subaru stores is light years ahead of our other son. Light years. And he, our older son would admit that. He's running two stores, has total responsibilities for those stores. Our son John is at the Toyota store and he'll take over next year. Um, but it's been hard for him because he doesn't have that basis. So I guess my message would be twofold. One is figure out what you want to do with this education as soon as you can. Figure that out. Because when I was at college, I was like a pin uh, pinball in a pinball machine, just bouncing off whatever I ran into until the next thing came along. If you can figure out what works, do it. And the second thing is apply yourself while you're here. This is a golden opportunity in your lives that you will never relive. And take full advantage. This is an incredible campus. It's the first time I've been able to see the campus, but I've been here a few times doing this talk. So um, those are my messages for today. So we're going to talk about Imagineering. Uh, I'm 25 years old, I'm the youngest GM dealer in the country, and I have no clue what I'm doing. I run into a guy named uh, 
um, uh, Billy Burden, and he, he had created a program called um, Investment in Excellence, and he's now a public speaker that talks all over the world. And his idea was, he was a college, he was a high school football coach, and he was having incredible success with his kids. Not only were they win winning football games, but they were scholastically doing better. They were getting along better with their parents, with their kids. So finally the parents said, what are you doing with these kids? And he started talking about the idea of thinking about what you want instead of what you don't want and setting goals and thinking about where you want to be and how you're going to get there. So that's where Imagineering came from. So we bought this package from this fellow and um, we started out, our original program was, was uh, 12 hours long. We'd make employees and their spouses come and sit through 12 hours of me and this guy on tape. So I'm going to kind of get started with a little exercise. So if you would fold your arms. Okay, as a public speaker, this is a very bad sign because it means you're closed off and you're not listening. So we're not going to stay like that for long. But you're comfortable like that, aren't you? We call that being in a comfort zone. Put your other arm on top. I think you've ever done that in your whole life? Probably not. I mean, that feels really weird, doesn't it? Put your hands together. Put the other hand on the other thumb on top. It just feels weird, doesn't it? So the point is that we're programmed. The way we behave is the way that our self-image is. If I get in a situation in which I need to get angry, I don't stop and think, okay, I'm going to get angry now. I get angry. It's just part of who we are, and that's why we behave the way we do. So hopefully what I'm going to teach you today, I'm going to give you some tools that's going to allow you to easily change that self-image so you can do whatever you want to do. Better golfer, better athlete, better student, better son, better daughter, whatever you want to do with it. So if you think of the thought process, you can break it down into three levels, conscious, subconscious, and creative subconscious. So in the conscious process, you're perceiving information that I'm sharing with you. You're then associating that information with every experience you've ever had, actually back before you were born. You're then evaluating that information. The only kind of information that gets through is information that is a value or a threat. The average human, the average American now sees over a thousand commercials a day. Remember less than 20 and are impacted by fewer than 10. That's why you see crazy ads to try and break through the clutter. So once you've made that evaluation, you make a decision. Do I fly, fight, or flee? Store the information for future use. All right. So if you would, read through that sentence one time. OK, pretty simple. Let's count a letter. Um, how about the letter F is in Frank? See how many F's you see in that sentence. Okay, how many saw three? Okay, about a third of the group. Four? Five? Six? Seven? Wow, are we not all seeing the same thing? Light on the screen? Some saw three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. I'll make this easy for you. Look, go back and count the word of, O-F. Okay, six F's now, everybody got six F's? Why is that difficult? It's a little word, doesn't mean much. It sounds like O-V, we learned to read phonetically, so it sounds like O-V. For fun, I had a bunch of salespeople in the room and I added the word, words of experts. So now there were seven F's. And I said, put it up, and they said, I said, how many F's do you see? And they said, come on, boss, we've seen this 10 times. There are six F's. It was a brand new salesperson in the back of the room, raised his hand. He said, no, I see seven. And they all in uniform, uniform turned around and looked at him like, okay, you've lost your mind. And he said, you better look at that again. And he stared at for him, and he said, you're right, there are only six. Peer pressure, right? You experience it every day. That's how powerful that is. He saw six. So we need to think about that. Okay, there's a paragraph. See if you can read that. Okay, it makes no sense at all, but you know exactly what that said, right? That's how powerful that brain is. Okay, so the subconscious process records and stores our interpretation of reality. For some of you, reality, quote unquote, the truth was that there were three F's on that screen, when that in fact wasn't the truth. So we kind of have to have a filter there. It also handles automatic functions like breathing and those kinds of things. The next level, creative subconscious, number one drive we have is a drive to maintain sanity. Helps us do that. 
allows us to creatively solve problems. We're going to talk about that a lot, and it provides drive and energy to move us towards what we think about. Okay, sit back in your chair, pick your right foot up, and make clockwise circles. It's hard to do standing. Take your right hand and draw the number six. What does your foot do? Did it go the opposite direction? I dare you to fix that. You can't fix it. You can set goals, you can do it. No matter what, you are hardwired to do that. That's how your self-image is. Everything you do is because of that self-image. All right. What I like you to do now, I get, you got a handout, you got a pencil. On your pencil, draw those nine dots. On your paper, draw those nine dots. Okay, what I'd like you to do is connect those nine dots with four straight lines without your pencil leaving the page. So the first one would be a box around the outside. That's four straight lines, pencil didn't leave the page with the missing center dot. Connect the nine dots, four straight lines, pencil doesn't leave the page. Okay, I've taught this class thousands and thousands of times. I've never had anyone solve this puzzle that hasn't seen it before. Seen it before? Okay. Did I just make it easier or more difficult? I made it impossible. No one has ever solved this puzzle. What does your brain do? Well, I don't have to try that anymore enough. No one's ever done it. Here's the solution. If I start outside the box, one, two, three, four. Okay, four straight lines connected all the dots. Why is that difficult? Okay, I just started outside the box. How old were you when you were taught to color inside the lines? Six? So that becomes very difficult for us. How could you do it in three straight lines? If I start far enough out and go through the top of that one, the middle of that one, I think I can do it in three straight lines. How could I do it in one? Big marker, <laughs> right? Okay, gotta get creative there. Okay, think of a number between one and four, and write it down. How many chose three? Raise your hand. Statistics say 75% of us will pick number three. How about number two? Okay, 20%. How about one and four? One and four? Five percent of this population will pick that number. Do psychologists and people that do commercials know how we think? Absolutely. We're predictable. Okay, attitudes. Positive, negative attitude. You think of a positive attitude, you're moving towards something, negative, you're moving away something from something. When I first did this, my first thought was, I'm thinking of things I'm positive, things I'm good at. One of the things I thought about is I have zero artistic ability. When my kids were growing up, it's a, it's a stick figure is the extent of my ability. One of these times I'm going to set a goal to become an artist, but at this point I am awful. So I started thinking about, wonder, how did that happen? So I remember back, we all had those teachers that had an effect on us. Mine was Mrs. Jensen, third grade teacher, bright red hair. She gives us an assignment, gives us a piece of eight and a half by 11 paper, watercolors, says, draw whatever you like. So I've always been a pretty organized, structured kind of a person. So I think, well, I'll paint the page blue, then I'll draw on the horizon, I'll draw a sailboat. So I just finished painting my page blue when Mrs. Jensen went by, came by and picked up my page and said, class, what do you think? Is that art or what? What did she do to my attitude about my ability to draw? Put a negative in that bucket, didn't she? Maybe I can't draw. At the time, I was a competitive swimmer. I loved to swim. I had a short buzz haircut. She said, not only can you not draw, you don't even need a comb. Wow. That's just not nice, right? So I went home, and I walk in there front, and I walk by a refrigerator, and it is covered with artwork. I start looking at it, it's all of my sisters, who's two years younger than I am. So now I don't have to say, Mark, you can't, I just, I can't draw. Every time I think I can't draw, what am I doing? I'm putting another bucket. I don't have to have Mrs. Jensen call and say, Mark, you're the worst art student I ever had. Every time I say I can't draw, I'm putting a negative bucket there, a negative rock there. How many of you say to yourselves, I'm really good at remembering names? Come on, raise your hands. There's got to be a five in the group like this. Okay, a few of you. Are we not awful at that? 
We can be introduced to someone and literally 10 seconds later not remember their names. It's as if we've been programmed to say when you hear two nouns like that, put them in the trash. Just automatically put them in the trash and we forget that. So years ago, there was a fellow, um, Lou Tice, who came to Salt Lake City and he was a memory expert. And a fellow walked in my office, uh, the, the company then was Laurie Miller Pontiac, I worked in the accounting office, and he said, I'm, a, I'm bringing a guy to town who is a world-renowned memory expert. And we're going to do a seminar at the hotel, and I'd like to have your people come. And I said, well, how, what do you want to do? And he said, could I come to your employee meeting and see if I can recruit him? I said, sure. So we had 30 employees. He came on a Saturday morning. We had a meeting. As, they, as, he came, as the employees came in, I introduced each of our employees as this young salesperson. He got in front of the group, and he said, let me see if I can remember your names. 30 people, perfect first and last name pronunciation. We were blown away. So a group of us signed up. We went to the class. As you went to the class, it was 500 people at a downtown hotel. As you walked in the room, you introduced yourself to, to Lou Tice. I said, Hi, I'm Mark Miller. And again, my name wasn't on the sign. So we go in and sit down. It's a three-night class about memory hooks and how your brain works and memor memorizing, memorizing things. And, and it was truly amazing. At the end of it, I stood in line to, to talk to him and say thank you. And I, I got up to, to the end of the line and I said, this was so wonderful. Thanks so much for coming to Salt Lake. He said, Mark, that was so nice of you to come say that to me. He remembered me out of 500 people. There's a fellow that is, is on record of attempting to memorize the Bible. Wow. The scientists in the world say that the very brightest amongst us use less than 10% of the neuron structure of our brains. So our hard drive has one-tenth of is used. The rest of it is available that we don't use. So how do we do that? I think it's through goal setting. We're going to get to that. So for years, Kathy and I, wife Kathy and I, have done a Christmas party. So um, it normally starts at 7 o'clock, a bunch of people. 6 o'clock, the doorbell rings. We're not ready. We open the door. It's my best friend, Bruce. He comes in. He's got a date. Julie he introduces us to Julie. He'd been in the bank that day. She was a cute girl at Teller, so we invited us to, at the, to the party. We sit, get him a drink, sit him down. We go get ready. We're scrambling around. Finally, at 7 o'clock, a bunch of people start coming. 7.15, Bruce is out the door. He's always the first to come, the last to go. So I call him the next day. I said, Bruce, what's up? What happened? He said, you know, I got to your house. I introduced you to Julie. Everything was great. He said, I guess when all those people started to come, I got nervous. I forgot her name. <laughs> I didn't know what to do, so I told her I didn't feel well, and I took her home. So I'm teaching this class to a group of branch managers at a local bank. A hand goes up in the back. Julie is in the class. <laughs> what are the odds of that, right? So I didn't tell the rest of the story, which is a year later they got married, and a year after that they got divorced. So it didn't, it, it didn't turn out well, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just crazy. Okay. Um, let's see. Let me, could you help me for just a minute? Sure. Did you just stand up? Yeah. Thank you. Welcome. So I handed him an inanimate object. He took it. I put my hand out. He gave it back to me. That happens in every culture in the world. Now think about that for a minute. Just a simple act like that. That's, again, our self-image defines how we behave. So let's talk about how we're going to change that. Okay, so self-talk. I can't draw self-talk. I can't remember names, self-talk. Not very positive ones. So self-talk, as I'm talking to you, you're talking to yourselves four or five times faster, and we use words, pictures, and emotions. So the formula we use is I times V equals R. So in our imagination, I can use my imagination to change my self-image, and I'm going to show you how we do that. All right, let's go. So how about comfort zones? Have you studied comfort zones some? Probably. So in the room somewhere, there is a thermostat, and it's set to 72 degrees. If it gets to 71 degrees, the heater doesn't come on. It has to get to maybe 68, and it has to get to 76 before the cooling comes on. But there's a zone there called the comfort zone. We all have, we have thousands of comfort zones. One is public speaking. Years ago, I went to a seminar the Utah Auto Dealers were putting on, and they brought a young man out to talk to us about a new insurance product. And you could tell that he'd memorized his speech. And he got into it, and he was just doing terrifically. He got in a couple of minutes into his speech, and you could see, just see the train leave the track. Mm -hmm. 
He stood like that for four minutes. Finally, the master of ceremonies came out and said, John, great job, thanks a lot, and off he went. So his comfort zone was here, it needed to be here. Where is it now? Here. Probably had a hard time talking to his wife on the way home. What happened when his boss said, John, you need to go talk to this group tomorrow? Not a chance. So how do you learn to be a public speaker? You took public speaking in high school probably, right? So what happened? You got up in front of, a gr of your group, your class, and you gave a speech every couple of days. There's a professional group for business people called Toastmasters. Every Friday morning, you go to breakfast somewhere, they give you a topic, you get up and give a four minute speech. So what's happening? It's changing your self-image so instead of I can't talk in front of a group to it's like me to be able to talk in front of a group and it becomes comfortable. I've got a million comfort zone stories. So Larry Miller is a big donor at your campus, was one of my a good friend and almost like a father figure to me. Um, he came to town in 1979. So we were Larry Miller Pontiac Subaru. He was Larry Miller Toyota. Confusion. He then, the second store he bought was a Subaru store. So now it's Larry Miller Subaru and Larry Miller Subaru in the same town. It was a disaster. So we got down, had a big discussion. He became Larry H. Miller and we became Mark Miller. So our, my management team thought this would be a great time for me to start doing our television commercials. Well, my comfort zone was right here. <laughs> my picture was standing on the showroom floor doing a commercial with all of our employees watching me laughing as I forgot my lines. Right? So they finally taught me to doing like a screen test. So Friday afternoon, they drop off 30 seconds worth of lines. They're gonna come Monday morning, we're gonna film this commercial. So I've been talking for uh, 20 minutes now. I had to remember 90, 30 seconds worth of lines. How hard is it? It's impossible. <laughs> when you start thinking about people loving, it's hard. So I'm practicing. 1979, I didn't have a video recorder, so I couldn't record myself where I would have been doing selfies. I practiced on the dog, I practiced on Kathy, I practiced in front of the mirror. So the commercial, I'm standing in front of some cars, I, just, well, I walk up between these cars and go, hi, I'm Mark Miller. And then I start this commercial. And so it's now 11.30 on Sunday night, I've got to be there at seven o'clock the next morning to do this thing. And I sit up in bed and go, hi, I'm Mark Miller. <laughs> Kathy goes, that's a lucky thing. <laughs> you at least know who you are. But I was so far out of my comfort zone. So now I've done hundreds of them and it's now what? It's like me to be able to do that. It becomes like me because I practice it. Okay, we're gonna talk about how we can use our imagination to have that experience. Now let me make sure I'm catching all of this. All right, so let's talk about goal setting for a minute. How old were you when you took your first goal setting class? What, what year in school? You took that, right, goal setting one-on-one? -on -one? No, didn't have that where you went to school? They don't have that anywhere. But you've been told since the time you were a little kid, you've gotta have good goals. So let's talk about what a good goal is, okay? So, a clear goal. Constructive, clear, accomplished, end result. First time I did this, a young, one of our service uh, lot techs, a young entry-level job at the dealership comes up to me. He said, boy, boss, this was so great. I've set some wonderful goals. I said, what's your, what's your best goal? And he said, I'm gonna be a millionaire. I said, well, that is a really good goal. How much do you make now? $2 an hour. So let's see, that's 500,000 hours without taxes. You will never get there from here. How about, what would it take to make $3 an hour? Well, I could get in our apprenticeship program and I could start doing, so what now was he thinking about? Constructive, clear, accomplished, end results. We had a service director that his first year with our service department increased our productivity by 20%. Unbelievable. I said, what do you do? And he said, well, I go out and talk to the technicians. And I say, if you made an extra $50 a week, what would you do with it? Well, I'd catch up my car payments, I'd buy my son a bike, I'd take my wife to Wendover. Constructive, clear, accomplished, end results. On the other side of that, we had a technician, Jerry Whipple, was with us his whole career. And for the longest time, every week, he billed 40 hours. And as a technician, you can bill 40 hours or 30 hours or 70 hours, depending on how productive and what kind of jobs you get. But every week, he billed 40 hours. And finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I went out and said, Jerry, why do you bill 40 hours every week? And he said, because I figured out if I bill more than that, whatever more I make, the government will take in taxes. <laughs> wow. We call that a flat world, like Christopher Columbus, right? <laughs> this is the world's shit, no, the world's round. 
So I had control of the computer system, right? So I went in, I wrote a program, I gave him, a, I said, okay, here's a check for 40 hours, here's a check for 60 hours, which one do you want? Well, obviously the 60 hour one was huge. He said, well, I want that one. I said, well, then bill more than 40 hours. Became one of the best technicians we've ever had, right? Because now he was thinking about a clear, accomplished end result. Accountability. If it's to be, it's up to me. There are a million motivational speakers in the world. But if it's going to happen, meaningful and lasting change comes from the inside. You need to think about where you want to go, where you want to be, how you want to do it. Okay? Would you stand up for just one second? Yeah. I won't pick on you. Can you hang out like this? Oh, God, you're strong. <laughs> Thanks. That was really good. I've done that 10,000 times. No one has ever let me push their hand back. Dang it. No one. <laughs> it's a half two. How many half twos are there in the world? A lot. Okay, any other guesses? A lot? How many half twos? There's one. One half two. You're gonna die. What else? Name another half two. Have to breathe. Well, if you don't breathe, you're going to die. But have to go to work, have to get a job, have to go to school, have to get up in the morning, have to exercise. It goes on and on and on. They're, I, mean, I think they're called New Year's resolutions, right? <laughs> have tos. When it becomes a have to, what do we do? When your mom said, okay, you can't go out tonight until you clean your room. Did you clean your room? No. You found a way around it and off you went. I go home today and Kathy has a list of stuff for me to do. Does it get done? Not my list, right? <laughs> right? So it's the way the world works. Have tos don't work, but what do we do? I have to start exercising. I have to lose 10 pounds. Whatever it is, when it becomes a have to, it becomes a challenge. Two of my favorite people that have gone through Imagineering, and I've given you my email address, and I hope you'll share stories with me, um, Glenn Crinky. Glenn Crinky started working for us when he was 17 years old. He was married and had four children. One was severely disabled. He started working our used car lot for $1.40 an hour. No high school education, let alone college education. Imagineering, took it to heart, set goals, became the general manager of one of our Subaru dealerships and retired four years ago as a leader of had 70 employees in one of the top Subaru stores in the country. Unbelievable story. Another lady, a wife of one of our office managers went through the class and she got up in front of the group. We used to ask them to share their goals at the end of the class. She got up in front of the group and she said, you need to know that I probably could not walk around this walk fast. I'm that far out of shape. I am going to run and complete the St. George Marathon. And the group kind of went, yeah, okay, <laughs> let's see if this works. She did it. Three years later, she ran and completed the St. George Marathon. Changed her world. So think about this, not just school. Think about your whole life, how you can use this stuff. Okay, we're gonna get more, tighten this down. Avoid time limits. So we talked about have to's, okay? We can procrastinate or we can, we can make it a have to. Neither one of those work. Confidential. As a leader of a company, I can't not, I have to share the goals with our team, right? If I'm the quarterback and I say, get in the huddle and say, snap on three and I don't tell my team to play, what's going to happen? I'm going to get killed, right? Because the defense is going to run right over the top of me. Same thing if I'm the leader of our company. I challenge you to go to any one of our companies and interview a, a, any one of our employees, 400 and something, 435 I think now, and ask them what the number one goal of our company is. And I would bet a lot that every one of them will say the number one goal of our company is taking care of our customers. Okay, so they know what the mission is. They know why they're there every day. And I challenge to walk through the dealership, and I'm not there every day anymore, but I'll run into someone that doesn't make eye contact and say hello to me, and we'll stop and have a little discussion about their me in the dealership and how important that is. So some goals I need to share. Um, we have an office manager that years ago um, smoked for years and years and years when trying to stop smoking, quit smoking. And she told everybody, I'm going to quit smoking. Well, I'd go in, I think I'm a pretty good coach. And I'd say, how's it going? Have you quit smoking yet? And she, what's her first thought? 
I'm going to go have a cigarette, right? It prompts that thing. So some goals you don't want to share. If you work in an office and you go in an office and say, I'm going on a diet tomorrow, someone will bring donuts. It's just the way the world works, right? So you need to be careful with that one. Ongoing modification. So as you get close to your goal, remember we talked about being able to see that clear accomplished end result. As you get close to it, move it. And finally, the most important part is goals must be written out. You really need to build a burning desire to have your goals on paper and think about them every day. I've given you a workbook that looks like that. So I would challenge you to have at least one goal in all six areas. When we first started doing this, we were incredible at setting goals in business, career, financial. We had, our management team was six. And of the six, we had two divorces in the first three years because they got so out of balance and skipped marriage and family. So we're now, we do a, we do a really good job of trying to build well-rounded people that work in our team. And try our, our definition of success is someone that is setting goals and growing in each of those six areas. Spiritual doesn't need to necessarily be religious, but it could be. But it could be spending time thinking about your goals. So what do I do once I have all those goals? Okay, the next step is called an affirmation. So an affirmation is simply one sentence, present tense, using action words, positive, creating a picture. Creating a picture. So I used to work, I don't know how many of you know Salt Lake City, but it's, it's kind of like Cedar City. There's mountains on both sides. Uh, here there's mountains on, uh, to, your, to the east, I guess. And I worked at our Toyota store. And I lived on the East Bench, so it was a pretty good bike ride. I like to ride a bike, so it was a pretty good bike ride home. But every time I got on my bike, I knew to a tenth of a mile an hour what my record time was. And every time I got on my bike, it was my mission to break that record. I was in the Olympics, and if I crossed that finish line and I broke the record, it was like time for a celebration. Because I created an affirmation that all I had to do was set a goal, I want to be in great shape, and then I wrote that affirmation. Um, I have to admit that I am a struggling ding-dong-aholic. You all know what a ding-dong is. So when I worked at the leadership, outside my office was the vending machine that had ding-dongs in it. And literally every day at 3 o'clock, I would go out and get a ding-dong, to the point where the people in the office just laughed. They ridiculed me. It was awful. So I set a goal, I wrote an affirmation. I am a strong and healthy person and I'm careful about what I eat. It's that simple. When I, read, when I say that to myself, I can see myself riding my bike up 21st South, which is one of the steeper hills in Salt Lake City, and not getting tired. And I can see myself setting that world record. And what's fun about affirmations is if it doesn't work, and I read that and it doesn't bring up that picture and that emotion, then I just write it again until it does. And I just keep doing it until when I read it, I get that emotion, I get that picture. And it, and it will change how you look at things. Here are some sample affirmations that we've used. I treat all of my customers like they were my only customer. What a world we would live in if that was the case. Wouldn't it be? When, when youngest son needed a, wanted a computer years ago, I thought this would, be great. this would be a good learning experience, right? Good dad. So I put on an old pair of Levi's and a t-shirt and a baseball hat and he put on some old clothes and we started shopping for computers. How do you think we were treated? <coughs> Not very well. I went home, put on a coat and tie, he put on some nice clothes, we went out and they couldn't wait on us fast enough. That's a really good affirmation for anybody in sales. Another story I'm not very proud of, but so I'm working, going to school working and selling cars for my dad. It's a Saturday afternoon. There are four or five of us on the showroom floor waiting for that magical customer to come in to buy a car. And a guy drives in in the oldest Pontiac station wagon I've ever seen. And he gets out and he's in bib overhauls, just filled, just like, he looked like a homeless person. And I look around, the other sales guys are gone. So I've, I've got to go help him. So I go out and start talking to him. And I'm, I did, I'm sure I did just an absolutely horrible job thinking there is no possible way this guy's driving home in a new, a new Pontiac. So it didn't take very long, off he goes. The sales manager comes out just as he's driving. I said, who helped him? And I said, I did. And he said, what happened? I said, well, see what he's driving? He couldn't afford a new Pontiac. And he said, really, did you get his name? And I said, no. He said, have you ever been to the Salt Lake City Airport? And I said, yeah, I've been there before. 
And he said his construction company built the Salt Lake City Airport. His name is Joe Howa, and he owns Howa Construction Company. He could have written a check for the dealership that day, let alone that car. Wow, what a lesson that was. You never know. In our business, you never know. An 18-year-old comes in and drives out in a $40,000 sports car. You, I mean, you just never know. I'm a professional the community looks to for an example. I'm a super salesperson. I grow every day in every way. I have a positive expectancy of winning big, and I take temporary setbacks easily. Um, the best salesperson in our organization sells 20% of the people he talks to. One out of five. That means the other four say, I don't like you. I don't like your cars. I don't like your prices. And I'm never coming back. Wow, I'm sorry. <laughs> but is that awful? But that's what they go through every day. What kind of a self-image comfort zone do they need to have? Wow, they need to be bulletproof. They need to be bouncing off the ceiling. And that's why salespeople, you look for high ego and high empathy. And you have to knock them off the ceiling every day to get them to go the right direction. But you have to be pretty bulletproof. I have a positive expectancy of reaching my goals and I bounce back quickly from temporary setbacks. I have pride in my past performance and a positive expectancy of the future and I have a clear and specific set of goals and I review them continually. I easily anticipate and experience events in my imagination. I'm going to show how I do that. And I know that people feel better when they do things well and it's easy for me to trust people to be their best. My dad had a program called the George Washington Plan. It's a pillar of, of business management. Do you know about that one, the George Washington Plan? If you do that again, I will make you a part of history. <laughs> wow, that's not a very good way <laughs> to run the, the railroad, is it? Billy Burr, or, um, oh gosh, I remember his name. Um, Ken Blanchard wrote The One Minute Manager, changed the world of business. Um, instead of putting people on a 90-day, um, experimental plan, we would hire them and now we follow them, we try to follow them around and catch them doing something wrong, now we try to catch them doing anything and saying great job, we're giving them more training, but it changed the way we looked at our relationship with our team. Um, so if you will set goals, write an affirmation and read it every day, it'll make a 10% improvement. If you will read it, visualize it and add that feeling and emotion, you will change so quickly it will amaze you. Okay, we've got a couple of minutes left. We're gonna do a couple exercises. Um, the first one is everybody stand up. Okay, you have to be careful not to kill the person next to you, but you put your arms up out to your sides. Go to your left as far as you can and make a mark on the wall. Okay, come back to the middle, put your arms down. Okay, we're gonna do that again, but we're only gonna do it mentally. So you're not going to lift your arms up, you're not going to turn. We're just going to do it in your mind. So close your eyes, relax. Hands are down by your side. In your mind, your arms come up. This time when they come up, they are so light, you feel like you could hold them there for the next month. It's just it's a, such a different feeling. You start turning to your left, and as you start turning, when you get to that point where there would normally be resistance, for some reason you just can keep turning and turning and turning until you've gone further than you could ever go. Okay, open your eyes. Arms up, go left again. Did you go further? Okay, thanks, have a seat. That's visualizing, pretty simple. Okay, here's another one. Close your eyes. You have to, this will be a little bit easier because it is cold outside, so close your eyes. It's a dark, dark winter night, three o'clock in the morning. For some reason you wake up and you get out of bed and you start walking to your kitchen and you're walking down a carpeted hallway but you come to the kitchen the kitchen floor is tile and it's so cold you can barely step on it it's pitch black but you find your way across the kitchen and you find the refrigerator you grab the refrigerator door and you pull it open and you're blinded by the light the only thing in the refrigerator is the largest lemon you've ever seen in your life it's huge you pick it up with both hands, you turn around, you leave the door open so there's light, you turn around and there's a, a counter with a butcher block on it and a huge butcher knife. You cut the lemon in half, you put the flat side down, you cut it in half again, you pick up, it fills your hand. It's a quarter of a lemon and it's huge. You bring it up to your nose and you can smell the aroma of that lemon. You've got a little cut on your lip and you know if you bite the lemon, it's just gonna hurt, but you can't help yourself. You open your mouth as wide as you possibly can 
and you take a huge bite out of that lemon and you chew and it's so sour you can just barely stand it but you can't help yourself okay open your eyes did I impact you physically you salivated is that fair did you yes that's your imagination changing your physical behavior that's how it works so you set a goal, you read an affirmation, and you visualize yourself, I can draw, I'm a great artist. You say that enough, pretty soon it's going to create the drive and energy to make you do what it takes to become a great artist. One of the really lucky things I've been able to do in my career is I was on the board of the National Auto Dealers. There are 20,000 auto dealers in the country. There are 50 board members that run this organization, and it's, a, it's an incredible place. And, um, I ran um, Deer Operations Committee and Members committee, committee, and then they asked me if I would be the Vice Chair of the Convention Committee. So again, you as a human, you can rationalize, well, that'll be great, because there'll be a chair, and he'll have to give the speech to 20,000 people. I'll just be the Vice Chair, this'll work. Okay, I'll do it. So, we go to the first, the first planning meeting, and um, they talk about all the people who are gonna come, and the convention speakers, and it's the first time they'd ever have a vice chairman. So they, I said, finally at the end, I said, well, what do I do? And they said, well, we'd like you to, to lead the inspirational session on Sunday. I said, okay, I can do that. And he said, we'll have a choir and a speaker you'll introduce, and then you'll have a few minutes to do a, a message of your own. And I said, well, I know Imagineering. I've got a very positive message I can share. My comfort zone's out here. I got it. So then I, we started talking about this, the people that were coming. It would have been people like, uh, Roger uh, Starback of the Dallas Cowboys and his coach Tom Landry and Norman Vincent Peale and some pretty high-powered speakers. So I, I got this. Then I asked the question on any public speaker's mind, how many people do you think will be there? And they said, well, last year we were in Atlanta and we had a pretty good turnout. But next year we're going we're gonna to be in Las Vegas, so we'll have a good turnout. You could expect between six and 7,000 people. Wham! <laughs> you can hear my comfort zone shut down. I've never talked to six or seven thousand people before and I was scared to death. How do you practice? You can't call your friends and say, I'm going to be at the special event center. Will you come over and let me practice on you? What do you do? Set a goal. Write an affirmation. I am the, I'll never forget this because I said it to myself a hundred thousand times. I am the best inspirational workshop speaker NADA has ever had. And I said that to myself over and over again. I pictured myself at the special event center with 7,000 people at a podium. I watched Ronald Reagan, the way he used his hands and the way he spoke to that group. It got down to the point where at the end, you know when Carl Malone would make a slam dunk and he'd go, yeah, you could just feel that, uh, that energy. That's how I finished. So the big day comes. Um, we're in a, the green room before we got on stage, and I kind of go out and peek, <laughs> and there are a lot of people out there, and the choir is all set up, and I'm visiting with my, the person I'm going to introduce, Captain Gerald Coffey. He was an aviator in Vietnam, and was now on the public speaker series. He'd been on the Tonight Show, and his story was that he was shot down and spent five and a half years in a prisoner of war camp. An incredible story. So we're visiting, just in the size, we're visiting, and I said, Captain Coffey, you do this every week, every couple of weeks? Do you get nervous? And he said, Mark, if I'm not nervous, I'm not at my best. I said, boy, I'm going to be great then because I'm really nervous. He said, oh, no, you're going to be fine. And then we talked and he kind of walked me off the cliff. So we go out and introduce the choir. They do a great job. Introduce Cappy Coffee. Talk about visualizing. You're in the back seat of an F-4 Phantom going into Vietnam on a bombing mission. Missile comes up, blows the wing off, planes tumbling. You and your engineer eject. You're floating into the bay. They're shooting at you. Captain Covey gets shoot, shot in the sh elbow. His engineer is killed. They put him in a boat, and he, you relive being in a five by 10 concrete cell for four and a half years with Captain Coffey. And you, we think we have it hard some days. Think about that. The torture, the power of the human spirit to do things. We use so little of that. We need to be inspired to get to that next level. So at the end, he goes, that means thank you. Place went crazy. I mean, it was incredible. I had to follow that, right? But I got up and did what I had practiced and visualized in my mind a thousand times and did my message. And at the end, the audience is clapping. We walk off the stage. We have to walk down some stairs. And we're about the second stair, and I go, yeah! <laughs> Scared him so badly, he almost fell off the stairs. He looked around, and I said, I don't know. I don't know what that was. <laughs> it was like, but I'd done such a good job of 
creating my, changing my self-image. It's not like me to talk to 6,000 people. I mean, how do you do that? But that day, I had changed my self-image so it was like me to be able to do that. You have that capacity to do anything. Anything. Set goals, write some affirmations, and be successful. Thank you. Twelve twenty-one. I was close. <laughs> so I, I, I know I'm not alone in uh, hoping that we can get the twelve-hour version of this. <laughs> yeah. uh, that was outstanding. Um, I personally feel um, more motivated and inspired, and really want to thank you for sp um, taking the time to to come down here and share your wisdom and experience with uh, with us. And I would like to present you with the oh. Cedar Award. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank, so you. thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Wow. That's good. Thank you.